Welcome to Lesson 5a, Calvin's Circulation Theorem. This will be the first lesson in a series on vorticity dynamics. First we'll define circulation, and then Stokes' theorem, applied to circulation. Then we'll discuss Calvin's Circulation Theorem, which applies to a material contour, and its physical significance. First, let's define circulation, which we give the symbol capital gamma. In tensor notation, it's a contour integral of ui dsi, or in vector notation, integral of u dotted with ds, since this is a dot product, where c is some kind of a closed contour, which is why we put this little circle on the integral. We'll let a be the area inside that contour. At some point along the contour, we have the velocity vector u, and then vector ds is tangent to the contour at that point. So you march around this contour and integrate u dot ds. This is what we're calling the circulation. There's a theorem you may remember from math class called Stokes' theorem, which deals instead with an area integral of epsilon ijk del fj del xi dak. And Stokes' theorem says that that's equal to a closed contour integral of fj dsj. In vector notation, we recognize this as a cross product and then a dot product with dA. And the right hand side is again just a dot product. This is Stokes' theorem. Professor, is that the same Stokes as the famous Navier Stokes equation? It sure is. Wow, he must have been one smart feller. Yes, he was, Dud. In fluid flow, we'll let this f vector be the velocity vector, uj. So Stokes' theorem becomes integral of epsilon ijk del uj del xi dak equal integral around the contour uj dsj. Compare this term to this term, and since i is just a dummy index, we can replace it with j and recognize this as our circulation gamma. On the left hand side, we recognize this as the vorticity vector omega k. So gamma is also equal to the area integral of omega k dak, or in vector notation, the integral of omega dot dA. This represents an alternate way to calculate gamma, the circulation. Now let's compare two circular flows as we did previously, solid body rotation and a line vortex. Both of these have circular streamlines around the axis of rotation. But for solid body rotation, u theta is 1 half omega times r, where the angular velocity omega is 1 half lowercase omega. As we mentioned in a previous lesson, this flow is rotational but inviscid. If we take a circle around this as our closed contour c, then gamma can be found by its definition which would be the integral from 0 to 2 pi going around the circle of 1 half omega r times r d theta, where at any location along this curve, ds is r d theta. If you do this integral, it turns out to be pi r squared times omega, going back to our result from Stokes' theorem. And since omega is just a constant everywhere in this flow, we see that the integral of omega over the area, which is this circle, is the area of the circle times omega. So that agrees with our analysis here. For the line vortex, u theta is gamma over 2 pi r, where gamma is the circulation. Whereas solid body rotation was rotational but inviscid, the line vortex is irrotational, except that the origin, where the vorticity is infinity, but it's not inviscid. Viscous stresses are not zero. So this flow is irrotational, but viscous. Again, if we take a circular contour around the origin and integrate, we get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, gamma over 2 pi r, r d theta. And since the r's cancel, everything in here is a constant. When we integrate, we get 2 pi times gamma over 2 pi, which is equal to gamma. This result turns out to be true for any c that includes the origin. But for any c outside the origin, the circulation is zero. So the only thing that matters for the line vortex is whether the origin is included inside the contour or not. Now let's define Calvin's circulation theorem. Calvin said that if contour C follows the fluid, in other words, moves with the fluid, then gamma is constant. 
it doesn't change as we move along with the flow. Well, if contour C follows the fluid, then C is a material contour. And we can use the notation capital D. If gamma is a constant following the fluid, then d gamma dt must equal zero, where capital D is the material derivative. So this is Calvin's circulation theorem in mathematical form. And we finish the theorem by saying that this applies only to an inviscid barotropic flow. This is Calvin's circulation theorem. I'll put inviscid in quotes because it means no net viscous forces, but the viscous stresses can be non-zero. Recall that barotropic flow means that rho is at most a function of pressure. So Calvin's circulation theorem applies in general to a barotropic flow, not necessarily an incompressible flow. But incompressible is the simplest type of barotropic flow, and we will be dealing with incompressible flows here. So Calvin's circulation theorem applies to inviscid incompressible flows. There's one other caveat. It must also have conservative body forces. I don't want to get into too much detail here, but a conservative body force can be expressed as the gradient of a scalar. For example, gravity. We typically write the gravity vector as negative the gradient of gz, where z is up and g is down. So gravity is a type of conservative body force, and that's the only body force we'll deal with in this course. So Calvin's circulation theorem will apply to the flows that we deal with. Now let's talk about the physical significance of Calvin's circulation theorem. If these are our flow field streamlines, and we have some contour C, which is our material contour at time t, this contour is a material contour that moves with the flow, and it can distort. So the contour will be some other place at t plus delta t some later time. If we calculate gamma at t and gamma at t plus delta t, Calvin says that these two have to be equal. In other words, the circulation is constant as we move along, as long as we don't encounter any significant viscous forces. In other words, we must meet the criteria for Calvin's circulation theorem to apply. This is the general case for a rotational flow. We can simplify for an irrotational region of flow where the vorticity vector is zero, then gamma, the circulation, must also be zero. And let's shrink the material contour to a point. In other words, let this contour go to zero size so that we're talking about a fluid particle. Then we can write this statement. A fluid particle that is irrotational remains irrotational unless it encounters regions where net viscous forces are non-zero. This statement is very useful and is also a direct consequence of Kelvin's circulation theorem. Take, for example, flow over an object. We start with uniform flow from left to right, some speed capital U, and the flow encounters some object in the flow, like a cylinder perhaps. In this upstream portion of the flow, gamma equals zero for any contour. And if we shrink that contour to zero, omega equals zero for any fluid particle, since vorticity is just circulation per unit area. From our study of fluid mechanics, we know that there's a viscous region in the boundary layer. And then in a flow that separates like this, we have a viscous wake as well. But everywhere else, the flow is approximately irrotational. If we draw some streamlines, there's one that hits the stagnation point. But a streamline above it must go around the object and perhaps merge into this viscous wake, which I should have drawn growing. Consider another streamline very close to the center line that goes into the boundary layer. A fluid particle here starts out irrotational, or zero vorticity, and it must stay irrotational as it moves along unless it encounters viscous forces. So it's irrotational everywhere until it gets inside the boundary layer and now it becomes rotational because of the viscous forces. The particle out here is also irrotational as it moves along and becomes rotational when it gets into the viscous wake. A subtle point here is that this particle can distort as it moves along. In other words, the particle distorts due to viscous stresses but remains irrotational if no net viscous force is encountered.
This is a subtle point not often understood, but a fluid particle can encounter viscous stresses and distort, yet remain irrotational because there's no net viscous force. And Calvin tells us that this particle will remain irrotational until it hits some kind of viscous region where there are net viscous forces on the particle. Then it becomes rotational, and Calvin's circulation theorem does not apply. This concept will become important when we study boundary layer flows later on. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos. One, two, three. That's all there is to it.